thank you for joining us for this week's episode. Uh, really glad you can make it. Um, I have two extraordinary gentlemen with me right now, uh, and they come from a really cool firm. And um, their firm, which is Hedgetech, uh, is a market maker in the crypto space. And one of the things that, a couple of things we're gonna cover in this episode is really the importance of what that is um, and the different challenges both they face as well as uh, coin token issuers um, and other instruments that they uh, may market make for. So I'm just gonna go right in. I'm gonna let these gentlemen introduce themselves um, and then we're just gonna do a deep dive and see what this is all about. Guys, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, Alex, thanks for having us. Great to be here. Uh, I'm here with Tom. My name is Laurent. We're the two co-founders of Hedgetech. Um, as you said, we're a market-making firm focusing on digital assets, um, but we also have some external activities, I guess. Um, so yeah, and I guess we can just jump into, you know, like the, the intro. So my background is in mathematics, pure and applied. Uh, my focus really is strategy design. This is this is really what I what I enjoy doing. Um, Tom, do you want to jump ahead? Yeah, uh, my name is Tom. Um, I have been an algorithmic trader for a couple of years. Uh, I started from a Chinese futures market and then later moved on to crypto market. Yeah, really cool. I mean, one of the first of all, a bunch of smart cats on <laughs> you guys. Uh, you know, know what you're doing. Your company is also it's it's not so much the traditional market making side. It's it's really a highly sophisticated, um, you know, algorithmic almost uh, type of uh, strategy that you guys use. But before we delve into that, how did you guys end up? And so many people always want to know this, so I ask this of everybody: getting making a living in crypto. How did, how did that go from the traditional side to all of a sudden, hey, we're crypto players? Right. Uh, I guess I, I can start Tom, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, for me, it all started with, um, okay, it was the lowest, you know, it had the lowest barrier to entry, I would say, in terms of, you know, like uh, these markets, I was attracted to trading and I was, you know, looking at, you know, some quote unquote technical analysis, I guess. And I realized that, you know, for crypto, you, at least at the time, you know, we're talking in 2014, 2015, maybe, um, you know, the barrier of entry was fairly low, right? Uh, regulations didn't kick in just yet and you could it was you know like you could do pretty much whatever you wanted to do so I was like okay this is cool I can experiment you know my strategies I can you know start you know doing some trading here and there and then I got into mining actually and I have a good friend who now works at uh, a large bank <laughs> who uh, started uh, this pro this mining project with me uh, and we had this project to we raised funds to a mining firm uh, in the, in Eastern Europe because of the cost of electricity. Uh, so it all started like this, right? And then you know, once I graduated, I was like, okay, I was headed towards you know medical school essentially. And I had this internship with this company where I actually met Tom, and they were doing you know some consulting, you know these types of companies, right? They do some consulting, some trading, you know they're somewhat you know flexible on their activities. And I met Tom there, and then. I realized that okay, there's this thing called algo trading, and you know back then I was a I was a manual trader really, so I was like okay, this is really cool. You can automate your strategies. You don't have to stare at a screen. You know, type numbers real fast and stuff. So I was like okay, cool, and that's how I got into algo trading and you know in crypto and generally speaking. Wait, hold on a second. That that, that story is is ridiculous. So. <laughs> One, you've uh, one thing I picked up on is you've been through different facets of of crypto, so you understand right. the different things like mining and the trading aspect and stuff like yeah. that. Um, two is you were on your path through medical school, yeah, um, which is which is unique in its own right. And then three, I noticed you had a friend who did the reverse path, which is instead of <laughs> a big bank yeah. and moving into crypto, he was into crypto and went to a big bank. Right. Right. All Essentially, right. yeah. No, but I mean, he had an internship during college, and you know, the the guy really liked him, and and they offered him a full time after he graduated. He's a fantastic guy, you know. So, uh, I'm not surprised, but yeah, he started off with crypto. Actually, I started looking at other markets, and then I moved to crypto, and now I'm, I'm you know, I'm focusing on digital assets, really, broadly speaking, because of the diversity of what we see in the crypto world really now. Um, but yeah, and he had the exact opposite path, yeah. I think, and next what I want to learn is how, you know, when you're working in uh, the China markets, right, where really uh, crypto was um, 
you know, the most provocative first, I'd say, you know, the most uh, accepted and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when, how did that, uh, how did your path uh, all come from the Chinese markets into crypto? And what did you see early on when you were working in the China markets? So actually, uh, I was an independent trader in China's market, but not the crypto uh, market. I was uh, trading in the futures market. Yeah. Yeah. So well, later on. Back then in the crypto, though, that you'd hear? Uh, no, I actually I was exposed to crypto uh, <laughs> fairly recently, I would say um, two years and a half ago. Right. Uh, I was working um, uh, in this company and I met Lauren. He has already have exposed to the crypto space for uh, uh, for a fairly long time. And uh, I was fascinated by this uh, new market. So uh, also when we were working in that company, uh, as Lauren mentioned, that company also does some market making. And uh, based on my experience in tr uh, the traditional finance, it's a little bit different than uh, what I would imagine. So we were discussing a lot of things. Uh, something based on my experience, I think uh, it shouldn't be handled that way. And uh, when while we discuss more, we find a perfect merge of the uh, of the strategies in traditional market and the new uh, uh, digital asset market. Right. So that's uh, where hashtag was born. Mm -hmm. And in fact, so what we will, I guess, get into the you know the the details later. Uh, but one of the things he mentioned, for example, that surprised Tom at first was that you could see the entire order book almost. And something that is not the case at all in traditional finance, right? Usually you have level one, level two, but you have you barely have access to you know like the spread essentially and a couple of orders up and down, but that's about it. And so he was really fascinated with this order book thing. And in fact, in all my trading strategies for profits, so alpha strategies, I was essentially using order book data. And Tom was really surprised. He was like, "How do you do this? Because you don't see the order." I was like, "Look, look at the UI. <laughs> you see everything." <laughs> so that was one key thing that that struck Tom, I think. Yeah. So in the traditional industry, usually you trade through a broker. You so for a retail trader, or even institutional trader, you barely trade directly from exchange. Right. However, in crypto, it's fairly accessible for everyone. Everyone can just uh, directly trade on exchange. So. Mm -hmm. They can see the full order book, and uh, so it surprised me that crypto market actually has more transparency than traditional market. Yeah, it would be actually. Um, I wonder how the markets would be if CZ actually sold off seats to the Binance Stock Exchange. You know, or <laughs> the exchange that would be interesting. Um, you know, market market makers are unless you're in the institutional side, like we all are. Um, market makers are something of a myth to regular people. Yet, right. play such an important role in liquidity and trading venues. Can you, can you guys just, for the average Joe, let's start with explaining what a market maker does and how it keeps the markets vibrant. Yeah, so market, making, uh, market maker basically, as uh, its name suggests, it places uh, maker orders. It adds liquidity to the order book, so other market participants can take this liquidity by placing market orders. Mm -hmm. So it provides uh, more stability to the price, it narrows the spread, and it decreases the slippage that the normal trader will face. Mm -hmm. So all in all, they increase the market efficiency for a given token, and uh, make this token more tradable, right? in a sense. So for example, I'm sure that any trader out there has seen a market where, you know, like the difference between the first buy and the first sell order on the order book is immense. And, you know, there's not so much that you can trade with. And essentially the market maker is here to ensure that all market participants can trade at a fair price, right? Um, then different people have different definitions of fair prices, but in general, as Tom said, narrowing spread, increasing the depth, so people can you know go ahead and take those orders. You know? Yeah, so I, you know for, for the average Joe doesn't see that. Um, what what they're looking at is when they're on exchange, and it could be a thinly traded, let's say, token um, or or one that is going through a high volatility period. Is that when they hit their sell order? 
you need to have a buyer on the other side of that trade. Correct. Yes. If you guys are the market maker for a particular token, you are that buyer in the absence of an organic one. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely true. That's, yeah. And essentially, people wonder sometimes, especially inexperienced traders, they might wonder why their execution price is much lower than what the market price was before when they sell, for example. And this is exactly what you mentioned, right? So you need to have a buyer at different price levels and in different quantities that will guarantee that you're not going to have a execution price that is much different than your market price. So, yeah. And is it like the, you know, so you think back to, let's say, the, the 80s, the 90s, traditional market makers, let's talk about, you know, one's market makers of the pink sheets, uh, particularly back in those days, um, where what you can call basically half or more of the crypto market these days. Um, there's always that inherent uh, risk to your business model in the sense that, you know, if you are a market maker specifically for, for an issuer, you have to make that market, even if it's not beneficial to you guys. That's absolutely right. And there's this whole concept of what is, you know, like profit and losses. People are always ask this question. You see, like the difference between market making and, for example, a hedge fund is that for a hedge fund, you might, you might start with one asset, say USD, and then you enter a bunch of markets, you diversify your portfolio, you open close positions on all those markets, but essentially your baseline is USD. With market making, it's much different because you have base and quote, so you have two assets to work with at all times. And so essentially, as you said, for example, the price goes down, we're going to be the buyers. And so we're going to lose, quote unquote, some quote, and we're going to gain some base asset. And so there's not really like a notion of profit and loss, although we could talk about it, but there's more of an exchange or an imbalance, you know, in the in the currencies that you hold essentially. So there are a couple of risks, for example, the risk of holding certain currencies, right? Certain issuers are not comfortable holding Bitcoin or Ethereum or even their own base, <laughs> like their token. They would rather consider everything in USD or USDT, stable coins. Uh, and so in that regards, there are a couple of ways we could go about it. Uh, Tom, you can mention a few. Yeah, so uh, first of all, as a very basic thing, so the point of uh, how market maker place their order is supposed to make that the price sometimes goes up, sometimes goes down. So the market maker place the order in a way that when the price goes down, the average price that we buy is lower than when price goes up, the average price we sell. So over a long period of time, the price goes sometimes goes up and sometimes goes down. We are making sure that uh, we make some profit from the difference of average buy and average sell. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, uh, something basic. And also, when we are holding some base currency that is very volatile, uh, if possible, if uh, there are such uh, instru uh, investment instrument derivatives, we will open the uh, equivalent short position of, uh, of the base currency that we hold. Mm -hmm. And also we have some certain strategies to hatch the exposure rate. For example, we have strategies, uh, what we call order book replication. Sometimes uh, a token is already very liquid on one uh, big exchange. For example, uh, the Bitcoin USDT market uh, on Binance is already very liquid and there is a fairly new exchange, smaller exchange, who want to hire a designated market maker. So what we do is to, we anchor the market, uh, the, the order book on Binance, and uh, based on that, we place some order on this smaller exchange so that whenever our orders on the smaller exchange uh, gets filled, we can immediately execute an opposite position on Binance to hatch the risk. Right. Um, Hence, we can migrate some uh, liquidity from the large exchange to the smaller one. Mm -hmm. And most recently, we have something very new. Uh, it's uh, related uh, to Uniswap. Because and liquidity pools in general, actually. Yeah. So a lot of new token, uh, DeFi token, uh, they start from Uniswap because it's very easy to get listed on. Uh, there's no listing fee, and uh, the community will probably uh, provide, provide some liquidity in the liquidity pool. Yeah. So this uh, new strategy of uh, ours is that we migrate some liquidity from Uniswap 
to an exchange because a lot of projects they want to they started from Uniswap, but later on when they have the ability to list on a, a traditional exchange, mm -hmm. um, they will want to do that because they don't want to miss out the opportunities of the uh, of the traders on a traditional exchange in a sense. So what we do is to place the order according to the liquidity provided on these liquidity pool. So whenever the orders are filled, we can fully hash the risk on the liquidity pool. So to take advantage of the liquidity that are provided on uh, liquidity pools like Uniswap, mm -hmm. to provide liquidity on uh, exchanges in a traditional sense. So you blew, you guys blew through a handful of questions that I had. So I'm going to just backtrack a little. And that was super awesome uh, explanation for all that. I'm going to backtrack a little and dissect exactly what you guys said. You know, and one of the first things that came to mind was like, hey, we got market makers. They have to take a position whether it's beneficial or unbeneficial to them. Um, why would they do this? And and how are their you know how are they ever supposed to uh, set expectations for their own business and BNL. So basically what you guys are saying in answer to that is you guys are basically hedging your own positions in the case you have a price action or an arbitrage with what you're doing go in the wrong direction. So yeah, so essentially like just to summarize like the, the risk hedging mechanism is like this. We're so as designated market makers, we are Suppose we're hired to quote on both sides. No matter if you know the price goes up, goes down, you still have to provide that liquidity. So how do we manage this risk? Essentially, first of all, we try to negotiate the terms <laughs> most of the time, but also we hedge the position, as Tom said, usually using derivatives, right? So for example, you're not comfortable gaining exposure to Bitcoin or gaining exposure to Ethereum or those big coins. What you're going to do is that you're going to open the opposite, so the short position. So essentially, when the price of Bitcoin goes up, you're going to lose money on the short. But when the price of Bitcoin goes down, you're going to make money on the short. So essentially, it's completely market neutral. Um, and if this alternative doesn't exist, for example, we're talking about like a regular token that doesn't have a derivative of its own. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to attempt to do order book uh, uh, replication. So essentially, if it's possible, find an exchange where they have a lot of liquidity and try to replicate that on venues where they don't have as much liquidity. And if this is not possible, we're going to look at liquidity pools and we're going to connect to those liquidity pools and we're going to attempt to hedge our position against the liquidity pool. Uh, by essentially replicating, as Tom said, building the order book in a certain way and replicating each trade on the opposite side on the liquidity pool. So, And, and, and that strategy also has benefits because a lot of people don't know, hey, listen, we have a startup exchange. Uh, the order book is very thin right. uh, and stuff like that. It, essentially, you're almost helping uh, jumpstart that uh, trading venue in the fact that you are doing that and you're driving liquidity uh, yep. from player over there absolutely and so you see for example we had a client uh, I would say a year ago approximately it was a, like a small exchange new exchange in Korea and what they did is that they came to us they knew our work from a prior experience and they came to us and right away when they launched the exchange they had a fully like tradable venue right because they had liquidity on all of their markets essentially they had like Bitcoin against a bunch of currencies Ethereum against a bunch and so on and so forth and you know, they had, because we were replicating on bigger venues such as Binance, Huobi, and you name it, right? So uh, they were able to have this tradable order book right away. And their traders who would come like, you know, day one, they would see liquidity and they would be able to take those trades and so on. So uh, definitely uh, great for small exchanges too, yeah. Because no one wants to sign up for an exchange and find out you can't trade it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are what are some of the biggest uh, risks that you guys take in participating in the market in in, in this position um, from a business stance, and and if so, do you have any uh, any any horror stories so far in in your um, length of time doing it? So still, uh, exposure risk still is, is still a, a risk. For example, some. Uh, some token that doesn't have directive and it doesn't have any other mar already liquid market for us to hash the risk. So and thus there will be exposure rate uh, risk. However, uh, however, 
they have the obligation to quote on the both side by the exchange, otherwise they will get delisted. So this uh, sometimes is uh, inevitable. Mm -hmm. Also, there are some um, risk of some bad order flow from the exchanges, uh, API downtime, and some uh, uh, sometimes the exchanges API are not that uh, accurate or uh, not that timely, has some limitation. Sometimes this can cause some uh, small risks. Mm -hmm. However, um, most of them, the known issues, uh, we will always find a way to resolve it. Mm -hmm. But this is more from like a technical standpoint yeah. and it has consequences on the finances, right? But I think your question was also pertaining to, you know, like the legal risks, for example, um, and, and such. And for example, you know, you have you have to do your due diligence on who you're doing market making for, obviously, right? So an exchange comes comes to you, you have to do some, you know, checks on on them. Same for like a token issuer. We had a case, and we so I will talk about this story. I, I don't think we've ever mentioned it, maybe, but um, we had a person coming to us, and we you know did our due diligence, um, and we ended up signing the contract, and right before listing. You know, uh, we heard something. We did some very in-depth research. It was like 24 hours before listing at that point. And essentially, there were a risk of uh, like them being a Ponzi. And we didn't have like proof that they would be. Now, this is just a random example, but we didn't have any proofs, right? But it, we didn't want to take any risks at the same time. So we tried to, you know, talk to, to them about this and not confront them, but essentially just ask them if they had any, you know, sort of like documents that would prove that they're not a Ponzi. And they sent us a bunch of documents. They were very cooperative, but it's really hard to prove <laughs> uh, wrong something that you didn't do, right? So like I, we didn't want to take any risks for the company, for the image and for, you know, ourselves. And so essentially we preferred to to sort of like uh, uh, seize any activity for, for them and, and just stop the contract. So this is definitely one story that, and I'm not saying that they were, you know, a Ponzi necessarily. I'm not saying uh, that I agree. It's simply just, we cannot tell if right, they are right. actually if, legit or if, not. If you're in the gray area, guys, with your business and who your clients are gonna be, I mean, you're always gonna side with your business, right? Protecting yeah. that. And of course, they may not end up to be anything wrong, if you if you don't have that warm and fuzzy feeling, you're not willing exactly. to, make, to find out. Never. And you never know. And essentially, our bottom line is that we don't want to do something even now, uh, even though you know regulations might kick in in the future. We don't want to look back and say, okay, this was not right. We want to make sure that we do things ethically and morally, and we don't you know try to uh, benefit from the lack of regulations or anything of that sort. So we try to essentially take the standards of the traditional industry and apply them to digital assets. So, yeah. So. With, with regards to um, issuers, uh, can, you give, can you give us uh, an insight into, you know, there's a new protocol or maybe it's just a, a new project or, or something of this nature and, and how uh, a token goes from being an idea to being minted to being a tradable asset into the market. Mm -hmm. So usually what, what happens is that, you know, a group of people come up with this idea, they want to raise funds. And one of the, the solutions that they find, they find usually is, you know, to go through this uh, tokenization process. Um, and so they will start, you know, most of the tokens, unless they create their own blockchain and, you know, have their token on this blockchain, they would be an ERC-20 or that kind of standard. Um, and they will simply create, you know, like a new smart contract for distribution, so on and so forth. They might add some mechanics depending on what they want to achieve. Um, but then essentially they're going to participate in an ICO or, you know, like an IEO or <laughs> you name it, STO, whatever. Um, so they're going to raise funds. Um, essentially to finance their project and to finance the team and the people that they need to hire and so on and so forth. And so it's a great mechanism to, you know, fund your project. But what people need to understand is that you also have to set aside a little bit of inventory for market making. And the reason it's important is because people see, you know, they have this timeline that, okay, they need to raise funds, they need to get listed and then what? And they don't realize usually that, you know, listing is just the beginning. And then you have to have, you know, like a whole life cycle for your token and it never ends and it never sleeps essentially because it's crypto, right? So they have to really, I think what we try to do is to educate, you know, new, uh, 
newcomers, I'd say, to, to the industry, that they should consider market making as a, as a, as something pretty crucial, actually, to the life of their token on secondary markets. And when I say secondary, I refer to exchange listings as opposed to primary, which is you know raising funds and so on. Yeah, and, and that's why uh, both exchanges and projects, uh, or at least the ones that have thought of have thought ahead, have market making programs uh, designated. Yeah. Um, with the rise of popularity in in DEXs, uh, that's come about um, almost to the point where, uh, even a year ago, we all know you know us in this room know what a DEX is, but a year ago, it, it was still. Uh, you know, kind of a secondary thought. Now it's DEXs are becoming almost mainstream to the point where even crypto hedge funds are going, hey, maybe we should be dropping, putting more flow through them and stuff like this. It seems to create some sort of efficiency in our trading model. Um, but with those and, and liquidity pools and, and various automated uh, uh, pools coming up, what is, uh, what are you guys doing? I mean, you have to fight for your business too, right? You have to pivot, adopt, and all this stuff. How are you guys adopting uh, to, to this wave? So for regular decentralized exchanges, uh, we actually have the capability to integrate. So we can perform market making directly. So for liquidity pools like Uniswap, uh, just as I mentioned previously, we have uh, strategies about that too. We can have strategies to take advantage of the liquidity that are already provided on these liquidity pool and migrate them to uh, uh, more order book based venues. Right. And also we have strategies that can uh, do arbitrage between uh, liquidity pools and uh, order book based uh, exchanges that can generate profits uh, mm -hmm. for our client uh, and uh, keep the price on the liquidity pool and exchanges uh, uniform. the uniform. Yeah. And I think uh, also, so you mentioned adaptation, this is definitely true, right? So I would say a year ago, we didn't have any uh, DEXs integrated. Of course, you know, Uniswap started, what, June, or at least we, we heard about it in June. Um, so, you know, like the key is definitely uh, being able to adapt to different market environments. I think one key takeaway that we have as traders, as market makers, is really the following. So essentially on, on you know, uh, decentralized exchanges and on liquidity pools, my opinion about it is that, yes, it is definitely more secure. Yes, it offers a, a great rewards. You know, when you participate to the liquidity pool, you can, you know, actually profit from just providing liquidity, which is uh, fantastic. But at the same time, I feel like they're more suitable for medium-sized trades and somewhat not frequent trades, at least from like an individual perspective. And let me explain why. Decentralized exchanges, usually it takes a few minutes, you know, because usually you process your transactions directly on the blockchain, which brings in security. Of course, you don't have like this one point failure type of thing with regular centralized exchanges. But at the same time, you know, you're bound to how fast the transaction can be approved. And, and so, you know, like from a trading perspective, I'm not sure this is very efficient, especially day trading, especially high frequency trading. So I think DEXs have limitations in that sense. When it comes to liquidity pools and automated market makers, such as Uniswap, they're great, again, for medium sized, you know, swaps. Um, but the thing is that, and their, their documentation actually says that, that essentially, you know, their price executes as exponentially worse rates. Uh, when it comes to large transactions, which is uh, which is actually the way it should be, but it can disadvantage some people over OTC, for example. And small trades, on the contrary, face somewhat high fees, right? Now, I'm not saying that Uniswap is getting the, all the fees for themselves. Of course, they put it back in the liquidity pool, but as a trader, you only see what you pay, not who gets it, right? Uh, so you, you face higher fees, so it doesn't make really small transactions very viable. So all in all, I think that you know centralized exchanges are definitely and brokers actually are definitely the most efficient trading venues when it comes to professional trading, when it comes to high frequency and so on and so forth. Now, of course, if you're like a casual user and you want to swap or you want to have you know these medium-sized transactions, perfectly fine to use on a non-frequent basis, I would say. So what we try to do is essentially to benefit from those infrastructures and make you know professional traders, make investors benefit from the liquidity on those venues. Uh, he, that was a great explanation. Um, you, you know, your firm, you know, I said it in the beginning, 
bunch of smart guys behind the screen here. You're running automated fashions, uh, you know, your business model. Um, can you explain a little bit uh, about this the automation? Um, obviously, market making in the past was generally done manual. Um, now you guys have the machine doing it, so to speak. Um, and also is, I mean, how many trades a day or uh, transactions can be um, upheld in any given day because of the automation? So, too many. To, yeah, uh, to I, I don't think. I, yeah, I don't think we can give you a number. I think we process 32 transactions per second. You guys uh, process 32 transactions yeah. per second. And this is all markets combined, right? Obviously, it's not on the single market, but we trade on hundreds of markets. So, yeah. you know, a bunch yeah. of exchanges. I think we have probably 30 something plus exchanges integrated and liquidity pools and dexes and so on. So, you know, like. Um, 32 the last number i saw probably a couple months ago was 32 per second and i was checking this because i was checking the server cost <laughs> and i was looking at <laughs> i was looking at okay how why why is it justified <laughs> and then i realized okay it makes sense um but uh, yeah tom do you want to talk about automation why is uh, automation better than uh, or more suitable than manual yeah actually uh i was never a manual trader because uh, I always believe in automation because trading is uh, basically once you you have the model to trade is a very repetitive job. It really doesn't make sense to execute a repetitive job manually. Mm -hmm. So so we have to uh, adapt to all the APIs, different API standards across ex different exchanges and also for the for all the DEXs and liquidity pools, we have to uh, integrate with Web3. Uh, we have to have our own Ethereum node, uh, so on and so forth. But once the infrastructure is built and the server infrastructure, everything is set up, everything will be very fast and very convenient. And scalable. Scalability yeah. is definitely one issue. If you do everything manually, as soon as you start having more and more clients, you're limited by you know, like human resources. Whereas you can just turn on a bunch of scripts and they do the job for you. And also, you know, crypto is never, it never sleeps, right? It's not like, you know, stocks where it closed, uh, closes at a certain time. Of course, you have different markets in the world, but still, generally speaking, crypto is always on. And so it's kind of hard from a human perspective to have teams, you know, in Asia, in Europe, in, uh, you know, in uh, America. And you have to combine all those efforts and making sure that everything runs on all the markets and so on and so forth. So automation is definitely, in my opinion, more suitable. And I was a manual trader. And back to the pre-med st story, <laughs> essentially, before I was going to class, I was placing some orders and I would come back to <laughs> back home and I would check if the orders were filled and repeat. And as Tom said, you know, once you have a system that actually works, you know, key is execution. And probably, and we know that machines are not the smartest unless you guide them. Uh, but but they're better at executing and they don't fatigue and they don't make mistakes. You know, obviously you have to code it properly, but technically they shouldn't make mistakes. So, yeah. One thing that is very uh, interesting is that once we built all these infrastructure that are integrated with these exchanges, with the uh, Ethereum network, uh, all the taxes and the uh, liquidity pools, uh, we actually have an app that can make normal people take advantage of our infrastructure, that they can use this app to run and monitor and control uh, the market making algorithm on our cloud server. Yeah, and actually even other market makers uh, uh, do so. And you would be like, why would you provide technology to, to your competitors? And the answer is very simple. We cannot manage everything, right? We cannot handle client relationships with uh, hundreds of projects. So we would rather get a little bit of you know, what they gain by having those relationships and establishing the relationship and maintaining it and so forth, rather than doing it ourselves. And it would take you know exponential amount of time. So essentially, we provide the technology to other market makers, great firms. Not saying that they're you know small or uh, not qualified, but you know they lack this scalability. They like the integration capabilities, and we provide that, and they provide you know sort of like the the relationship side of things. So yeah. Okay, so that that's the the B two B model uh, you guys yeah. have incorporated almost. Because the next thing I want to do was just run down what your product stack is uh, to kind of cap this all off. What you guys offer uh, to the markets. 
um, out there and as a whole? Sure. So our client base is the following. We have uh, issuers, token issuers. We have exchanges, obviously we mentioned that, and we have other market makers. And sometimes, you know, brokers come to us and they might want to integrate, you know, the strategies directly on their platform as well for, you know, users to use. Um, so this is our client base. And in terms of product, we have liquidity solutions, right? So we have pure market making, we have stable market making, we have market making for derivatives, uh, order book replication, migration from liquidity pool. And then we have sort of like profit oriented strategies, enter exit, so liquidation, you know, for a profitable price uh, without impacting the market price. And then we have arbitrage, of course. And then we have also this tool called schedule. Essentially people are able to automate their strategy without having any coding background, which is pretty cool as well. So this is our uh, package, I would say. And it comes, you know, with an app, a very clear documentation, very detailed. And yeah, that's, uh, and sometimes, you know, we manage things for, for people, for example, issuers, they might not have the time or team or knowledge to run everything by themselves. So they rather, they would rather have us deal with it. Uh, but for example, exchanges, they have an internal team that can take care of market making. They would use our app. Market makers use our app 100%. So, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's fascinating um, how it, 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 it's not just the actual market making. There's so many use cases for what you guys uh, have developed. Um, and, you know, for, for people watching, just remember, these are the guys in the shadow. Uh, you know, you don't see them, but when you hit trade and you execute an order, uh, most of the time it's it's gentlemen like this who are making that order fill and keeping, uh, you know, the market environment stable. So, guys, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. Um, all their information is going to be in description, everything about them, how to reach them, see what they do. Uh, Hedgetech.io is their website. Um, but guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys taking time out of your schedule. Thanks, Alex. I'm really thank glad to be here. Thanks for having us. All right. Have a good one, guys. You too. You too. Bye.